Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So did you hear the story a little more than a month ago about that jogger up in Colorado uh, near Fort Collins who was attacked by the mountain lion? Did you hear that story? Remember reading about it? If you ever read the story or if you heard some details about it uh, or if you've ever just walked alone through a forest actually, uh, it's enough to make you nervous and, and it's a pretty creepy story. You see what happened was it was a rather warm afternoon in early February uh, and this young man, Travis Kaufman, all 5'10", 155 pounds of him, decided that he was going to go for a run up in the mountains. And so as it was, he was passing through this uh, narrow wooden section of trail when behind him he heard some pine needles rustling and it's the kind of sound that a squirrel can make, it's the kind of sound that a deer could make, but he happened to turn around and look and see what made the noise, and that's when he saw this young mountain lion behind him. He saw that mountain lion about 10 feet behind him, and immediately he did what, what all the nature experts tell you to do. He threw up his hands, he screamed and yelled as loud as he could, hoping to, to startle the lion and to scare it away, but the lion pounced, the lion attacked him, and so then began a life or death struggle that, that lasted for about 10 minutes and didn't end until that young lion uh, was, young lion was suffocated. Um, hearing that story and reading it gives me, gives me chills and sweaty palms, and I'm sure it does the same for all of you, kind of make, I'm never going to walk in the woods alone ever again. Um, but this week, as I was studying the Bible section before us, the account of Jesus being tempted, I had a realization that what this man experienced physically is probably very similar to the spiritual experience of temptation. And the Bible actually even calls the devil a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, temptation is wrestling with a lion, and that lion attacks us every single day. So how can we escape? How can we overcome? Well, that's what we see as we look at the account of Jesus wrestling with the lion, Jesus being tempted in Luke chapter 4, uh, which we'll hear right now. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple if you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And this is God's word. And so as we... Uh, as we encounter this, Luke sets the stage for us for what's going to happen. Jesus had been in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 days without food. And so to say that at the end of the 40 days, Jesus was hungry, that has to be a massive understatement. Jesus had to have been well beyond hungry at this point. And so like a lion stalking its prey, the devil knew that Jesus was weakened and that now was a great time to attack. And so he came at Jesus with three specific temptations. The first of those three aimed right at Jesus' hunger. He said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You see, the line of attack he was using went like this. Jesus, you're God's son, right? So if you're God's son, why should you, why should you be hungry? I mean, hasn't your heavenly father promised to provide for you? How, how is that working out, Jesus? You see, if you're the son of God, you deserve to eat. You need to eat, so... So here, turn this stone into some bread so that you can eat. After all, you've got the power to do it. So why should you, the Son of God, be going hungry? 
See, in the end, this temptation was twofold. The first half of it was a temptation to to doubt and to disbelieve uh, God's love and God's care for him, for Jesus to think that because he's in this state of hunger, it must be because God doesn't love me. But the second part of it, the second part of the temptation was to use his power as God's son, but to use it for his own selfish purposes, to use it for his own personal gain. And so what did Jesus do with this temptation? Well, he responded, quoting from Deuteronomy. He said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. What he meant to say there, what that says is he's telling the devil, look, there's something in life that is more important than a fuller stomach. And that is a fuller soul. And, And only God can give that fuller soul. Only God can do that for me. And so I am not going to fill my stomach at the expense of my soul. The second temptation, uh, the devil aims at a different target. It says that he led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. If you worship me, it will all be yours. The heart of this temptation was, basically it was a shortcut to glory. You see, Jesus no doubt knew that that one day, Uh, he would be king over all the world, that the whole earth would be a footstool for his feet. But Jesus also knew that before that was going to happen, that he had to go through the most bitter suffering, psychological, spiritual, physical suffering, and then finally death. That before he could have this glory, Jesus had to first go through the cross. And so the devil was presenting him with what seemed like a shortcut to that glory. Yet the shortcut came with a twofold cost. The first thing to notice, the glory and splendor that the devil promised Jesus, it was not eternal glory and splendor. It was just the glory and splendor that, that this world had to offer. No doubt which would one day come to an end. And then the second part of the cost is it would come by serving and worshiping the devil rather than his father in heaven. And so if we wanted to summarize this temptation, it's, it's a promised shortcut to glory, but to get there, it means compromising on Jesus' values. And so how did he respond this time? Well, very similar to the last time. Once again, he quotes from Deuteronomy, saying it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, I serve the Lord my God and no one else, no matter what you promise me, no matter how great the thing is that you promise me, I only worship and serve my God. And then finally, the third temptation, the devil takes Jesus uh, to, the Jerusalem, to Jerusalem and rather, and then on top of that, to the highest point of the temple. You see, there was actually a corner of the temple wall that looked out and down over the Kidron Valley, which was just outside of Jerusalem. It was a dizzying drop of, of about 400 feet from the top of that wall to the bottom of the valley. Uh, the kind of drop that to jump or even just to fall from it would spell certain death. And so there the devil tempted Jesus once more, saying, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in your hands so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. See, two times prior to this, Jesus had used scripture to refuse the devil's temptation. And so, and so now the devil kind of says, all right, Jesus, you want to play this game? You want to quote the scripture here? Listen to what the scripture says. He'll command his angels concerning you. They'll catch you, so, so go ahead and jump. You see, the heart of this temptation was, in effect, to, to misuse a promise of God and, and to misuse it to justify foolish behavior. In effect, it was daring God to keep his promise or trying to force his hand to keep that promise of protection, saying to Jesus, God's not going to let you die. Jesus, he loves you. He's promised his angels to protect you, so, so go ahead and do it. Jump! Once again, Jesus responds to this temptation, uh, as he has with all the others, quoting once again from Deuteronomy, saying, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then finally, after three times coming at Jesus with a specific temptation, three times being refused with scripture, Luke says that the devil left Jesus, but he didn't leave him permanently. He says that he left him until an opportune time. That he wasn't finished tempting Jesus at all, but but he was going to come at him again with temptations and he was going to do it when the time was right. And so we look at how the devil tempted Jesus. And I think we can see that the way that he works, his methods and his aims have not changed much or really at all since the time of Jesus. He still comes at us with with lies and with half-truths. And with those lies and half-truths, he still seeks to lead us 
to first of all, to doubt or to disbelieve God's word, to doubt or to disbelieve God's love. He still wants to lead us to believe that, that God's word and God's will is not good for us, that, that it's actually bad for us, that God doesn't have our good at his heart. He still seeks to lead us to take matters into our own hands when God seems to be working too slowly for our taste. He promises us earthly fool's gold at the expense or at the cost of walking away from God and and he still whispers God's promises in our ear, not to strengthen our faith, but to lead us to justify ourselves in acting foolishly. And then finally, with all of these, he still comes at us at an opportune time, whatever that might mean in your life or mine. For some people, an opportune time might be when when life is going really well, when you're, you're making good money, uh, you're being successful, life is good, you're, you're happy, and things are going smoothly. What does he tell you then? He says, you're doing pretty great on your own right now. I don't think you really need God's help. And for other people, it can be when times are really hard, when things are bad. He'll tell you, you know, if God really loved you, you wouldn't be sick. If God really loved you, you wouldn't be struggling. If God really loved you, your family wouldn't be dysfunctional and so on. No, those are the opportune times. Now, I think for most of us, he comes at us in both, right? Times are good, he'll lead us to self-confidence, and when times are bad, he'll tempt us with despair. And when we look at the human race's record in resisting temptation, that record doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, does it? Um, Go back to the first temptation recorded in the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. He comes to Adam and Eve, the first humans, with a temptation, and they fell right into sin. They doubted God's love, doubted God's goodness, believed the lies, and all of that led them to take matters into their own hands and to eat the fruit from the one tree that God had told them not to eat from. A look around the world today reveals much of the same. People today still go for the the earthly fool's gold that's out there. I read a statistic recently that our nation has a record amount of credit card debt, upwards of a trillion dollars. Well, why is that? We're going for the earthly fool's gold, oftentimes at the expense of our walk with God. And people still use God's promises as an excuse to act foolishly. Well, well, God will provide, so therefore I can use my money or my time however I wish. I don't have to think about being smart with it. And then what about your record and mine? Are we any different from the world around us? No, ours isn't so, ours isn't so hot either. We, too, at times fall into sin by disbelieving God's love. We, too, at times fall into sin because we take matters into our own hands and so on. Now, since all of you are here today in church, I'm going to make an educated guess that you don't want that to be the case. You don't want to fall from temptation into sin and into that trap. We don't want to do it, and, and, and yet we do. And so what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is to explore the question, why? Why do we often fall for the, the devil's temptations? Why do we often fall from those temptations into sin? Now, I do want to be careful not to oversimplify, but I want you to think for just a second. What do you do when you find the devil whispering a temptation in your ear like Jesus did? How do you try and overcome that temptation uh, when he presents it to you? You see, we can learn something uh, from Jesus refusing the devil's temptations by quoting scripture again and again and again. And the thing that we can learn is not just that we should quote scripture when we're tempted, though that, is, that is, though that is a good practice. But you see, if there was ever a human being who could have overcome temptation by his own sheer willpower and by his own sheer strength, it was Jesus. I mean, after all, he was the son of God, true God and true man. But that's not how he did it. What did Jesus do? He used the scriptures And he used the scriptures not just as a club to send the devil away, but he used the scripture, he quoted it as a source of God's strength and as a connection to God's power in his life. You see, using the scriptures was Jesus' way of relying on God's power and not his own to overcome temptation. And when I think of a lot of the whys of our falling into sin, Many of them have to do with thinking that we can face temptation alone, that we can escape that temptation alone and overcome it. We, we tell ourselves, I just need more determination. I just need a stronger will and more willpower. But then we end up in the same old place, doing the same old things that we know are wrong and that we, don't, and we even don't want to do, yet we keep on doing them. You see, we forget that the devil's like a lion. 
except not a young one like that hiker overcame. The devil's strong and crafty uh, and cunning and sneaky and thinking that we can overcome him on our own uh, really amounts to just a form of pride or even beyond pride, it's arrogance. And so today Jesus calls us to give up facing temptation alone, to give up our illusions of spiritual self-sufficiency because the truth is we can't do it on our own. And the evidence of that is that we so often fall into sin. But friends, it is that failure on our part that tells us the answer of why Jesus was there walking the earth and why he was there being tempted by, by the devil in the first place. Yes, Jesus perfectly resisted the temptation, but he didn't just perfectly resist them. He resisted those temptations in the perfect way every single time. Each time he resisted, not relying on his own might and his own willpower and his own strength, but each time relying on God's strength, which he accessed through the scriptures. You see, Jesus didn't have to give up facing temptation alone because he never tried to face it alone. He always relied on God. He always relied on God's strength and God's power to overcome his temptations. He won the victory over the devil on this day and on every other day that the devil came whispering in his ear, even when it was an opportune time. And every time that Jesus did it perfectly, it was for you and it was for me. You see, Jesus overcame the devil's temptations by relying on God's power and he did it perfectly and he did it completely for us. That's to say, he did it perfectly and completely in our place. And so because of this, by faith in him, when God looks at you and me, he sees people who do resist temptation because he sees Jesus' perfect record having been given to us. And then the same Jesus wins final victory over the devil by dying on a cross outside of Jerusalem, dying on that cross for all the times that we listen to temptation, all the times that we fell from temptation into sin, all the times that we relied on our own strength and our own might and our own wisdom and power and all the times we didn't overcome, and then he rose again. And so by his perfect life, by his death and by his resurrection, sin, death, and the devil have all been defeated. They've been defeated permanently. Jesus has won the victory and by faith in this Jesus, he gives us the victory. He makes us the winners in that battle. And in that victory, Jesus doesn't leave you alone to face temptation. In Hebrews chapter 2, it's, it says, talking about Jesus, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. See, so you, can, you can give up facing temptation alone because you and I have a God and a Savior who, who knows what it's like to face temptation. And not only knows what it's like, but who is more than able to help and is more than willing to help you. That he is ready and he's available to help you when you call out to him in prayer in the throes of temptation or when you call on him through the scriptures. And when you're in those throes of temptation, he's there to remind you that by his own perfect life and by his death and his resurrection, he has overcome the devil and that the devil's already been defeated. And then when you're loaded down with guilt and shame for all the times that you've given in, he's also there to remind you that by his death and resurrection, you are forgiven. The battle's already been fought and Jesus has won and he's broken the power of sin over you and he's broken the power of the devil over you. The hymn that we just sang right before the sermon, The Mighty Fortress is Our God, the third verse of it, uh, in that third verse, Martin Luther captures the thought just beautifully. He says, this world's prince may still scowl fierce as he will, he can harm us none. He's judged the deed is done. One little word can fell him. So imagine that encounter with a mountain lion, how it might have gone differently if that jogger wasn't out by himself, but he, if he was out with a friend or, or two friends. If he was out there with a friend or two, maybe that lion never even attacks in the first place. Or maybe if it still did attack, that, that wouldn't have been the life and death struggle that it was. You see, there's a certain strength that comes from not having to face challenges alone. Well, in Jesus Christ, we do not have to face the devil. We do not have to face that roaring lion alone. Instead, we can give that up because we have a friend. Actually, it's a whole lot better than a friend. We have at our side the Son of God and our Savior. So we can give up facing temptation alone and we can instead rely on Jesus' victory over sin, death, and the devil for us. Amen.